Tonight, the crisis in Belarus still unfolding. Further demonstrations in the country against Alexander Lukashenko. Demonstrators have been demanding that Mr. Lukashenko stand down. Really, for 26 years, this man was trying to persuade me that I am nothing. Tens of thousands of Venezuelans have taken to the streets of the capital, Caracas, in an attempt to topple President Maduro from power. Once a woman has conviction and when her values are at stake, women won't let go. Beijing imposed a new security law on Hong Kong. Police have carried out dozens of arrests. Pro-democracy activists are calling for people to rise up. It is always the darkest before dawn, but I believe that any time Hong Kongers will be ready to get back our Hong Kong. The Lebanese economy has spiraled into its worst crisis since the Civil War. 1.5 million people have taken to the streets to call for political and economic reform. Seeing how people took back the streets five days after the explosion, it gives me hope that people won't give up. They will protest. I should say that the last 26 years, I've been living in Belarus. And during this time, the Belarus was reigned by uh, Lukashenko. For me, it was not easy to leave Belarus. And to tell the truth, uh, I was involved into oppositional movement since I was 18 years old. If to try to overlook the whole situation from the distance a little bit, for me, uh, this is the conflict of two mentalities like the old Soviet one is out of life. I belong to this new generation and our values are freedom in all the ways. In this year, for me, it was like the last drop because when I realized how great violence was made in Belarus from the side of Lukashenko, I was very angry, like furious. And for me, the question to go on the streets or not to go didn't exist at all. My story and activism in Lebanon started after a series of assassinations in 2005. I was 15 years old, so I was old enough to understand what was happening. There were a lot of protests taking place back then and uh, I participated in the protests with my family. So this is when um, I was introduced to the concept of democracy, of protesting, and of people or politicians being killed or assassinated because of their political views. I grew up and I became a journalist, and my job as a journalist is to actually cover any uprising that is happening, either in my country or in the region where I work. Now, coming from Lebanon, this becomes a special case where you're not only reporting on your country, but you're also affiliated with the cause because you witnessed all of this political change and all of these political problems, as I mentioned, since 2005. The same political class, the same names repeating themselves, and the same corruption system. So you become embedded with the cause, so you directly become an activist, if you want it or not. It's dangerous for me to talk about all the details without actually covering my face. If they recognize me or anyone, I might be caught and sent to jail because of the national security law. When the whole movement started in early June 2019, I was studying in Australia, readying for my exam. Basically, I couldn't focus at all because I know all my friends and I'm really afraid to one day I will see the name on the news about like they being caught or they being hurt. It was quite terrifying through those times. I was in Australia at that time. I was just hoping that I'll finish everything as soon as possible then I can come back to Hong Kong, at least be like a part of it. Staying in the other side of the world, feel hopeless and helpless. You watch all those things happen, but there is no any way you can help personally. So I basically just get the fastest ticket to Hong Kong. And then I became an activist in the protest. My personal story is one of swimming upstream all my life. 
I'm Venezuelan and I'm part of a generation that grew up feeling deep rejection and distrust towards politics and politicians. One day, having lived all my life in a democratic nation, we found that the threat an operation to dismantle Venezuelan democratic institutions took place when Hugo Chavez came to power. And we suddenly realized that freedom was really at risk. That changed my life forever. Hugo Chavez started moving ahead, progressively reducing all kinds of liberties in Venezuela and increasing the social tensions, dividing our society. At this point, I realized that I could not stay away. When we talk about the Lebanon protests, um, we tend to call it the women's revolution or the women protest because so many mothers were taking the streets with their sons and with their daughters to encourage them to protest and to demand the complete abolishment of the sectarian system. So we had significant protests happen between areas that witnessed um, clashes back in the civil war. Uh, sensitive areas like Shiyah and Ain al-Rimene, which are a Christian and a Muslim area. Mothers took their uh, kids and went to the street with flowers and then they stood with each other and they screamed and they asked the men to stop fighting after all these years, even if it's just verbally. <laughs> Women can multitask in terms of organizing and collaborating together, creating uh, plans, understanding what it means to go to a protest, but at the same time, in the back of their heads, understanding that their male uh, colleagues or their male protesters might be arrested, so what to do? The role of motherhood is not easy. It's embedded in our DNA, whether we want to be mothers or not. Um, and I think that this led every woman in every protest worldwide to feel like a mother, like she should act like a mother, she should protect her friends, her brothers, protesters around her. So multitasking was a key component to these protests and this is how women uh, were actually not pushed to the front but decided to lead on these protests. Serving as a buffer uh, was the main thing that everyone was talking about worldwide when they talk about uh, women in protests. But they cannot stop the thing that will happen eventually, which is intense male protesters and sometimes females too, um, pushing security forces and trying to break into any official building that they have inside. Now, I understand that this is bound to happen anywhere, and of course, no one is going to a protest only to sing and to have a festival. It often reflects the pain that protesters feel. If I'm to compare the same protests where women were pushed to the front in the same spot, they managed to keep it kind of safe and kind of calm, at least for an extra hour. So I think that if women step up even more and try to organize specific demands for the protests, I think that definitely protests in Lebanon would happen on a longer period of time. Not every protest would turn violent and protests will actually be continuous. I think that they need a continuity where you have demands and where you follow up on them. Certainly, large-scale participation of women in protests and citizen organization in Venezuela is, is not only remarkable, it's essential, it's, it, it's indispensable. And it's important to understand why there's so much impact in women commitment to this struggle. The incidence of women's decisions is huge among the family and in young generations. And that's why we were able to see for the first time, Venezuelan society was mobilized at the beginning of this regime was because women decided to speak out in defense of our families, in defense of our children. And the presence of women have been constant as the protests have evolved in the last years, we've seen that over 80% of those who speak out against the regime nowadays and organize at the community level are women. So women has been the most powerful strength that's been all the way guiding 
and accompanying the voices and the decision of a society that is determined to be free. Before the first female march or female demonstration, uh, we were discussing it in chat. Like, mm, let's do only with the girls, no men in our crowd. Why? Because, you know, we are living in a patriarchate and it seems that it's true that military people will not touch women. And we decided to use this situation and really it was working for the first time. So the first demonstration was in Kamarovka market. They were only ladies, all in white clothes with beautiful flowers and everybody was so scared. <laughs> we were staying in line, you know, holding each other or having the arm up and the police came and my sister asked, do you think they will beat us? I thought, no. When we all began to cry, Живе Беларусь and all other things we were crying, I asked her, how do you feel now with all this support? And she said, wow. I couldn't imagine that it will influence me so much. I feel happy. Can I cry? <laughs> and in one day, everything has changed. And the police started to beat old women, pregnant women, young girls, 14 years old. We still have these videos. Oh, it's even hard to, to speak about it, to tell the truth. Yes, everything has changed. In the beginning, we could play a little bit on this, you know, patriarchic trick, like men will not touch the woman, but Lukashenko is so crazy that he has no limits. And unfortunately, now women are suffering at the same level as men. Yeah. Being a woman in the front line is Honestly, quite scary because people are saying like physical limitation are limiting us from going to the front line because we might not run faster than the men and the risk of us getting caught is higher and the consequences that we might pay is higher than men getting caught to. There are rumors about like women being raped inside the police station, being harassed. And this kind of news actually scared people away from being in the front line. And there were news about a girl being pregnant after being harassed in the police station. And that is not something that you can just make up. It is like, official report filed against them and a girl stood up and said like I was being harassed now I'm brave enough to stand up and tell this to the whole world that this is the truth and I think that bravery is not something you can build upon a lie For me, it was not easy to leave Belarus because in Belarus I had a very detailed plan. What should I do for the next 10 years uh, from the point of uh, cultural work, musical work, of my private life. But I felt in one day that the risks are too high. Before the presidential elections, I was training oppositional leaders for voice. Now everyone who had just a slight touch to oppositional leaders, all those people are in danger. And when I have discovered that many activists are taken just one by one, I thought maybe it's time for me to think seriously about relocation. And this year I'm a single mother with uh, a baby and um, those stories when pregnant women and breastfeeding women were taken to prison, they scared me a lot. And one evening, the uh, participants of this demonstration, they decided to shout out something or to sing a song to support those people who were imprisoned. I, I was playing with my daughter and my sister was, you know, like the, uh, this voice in the movie. And she was seeing the happy eyes of her daughter for the last minute in her life. And I felt so bad. Two or three times I was running back home 
thinking about my baby, that maybe I will be killed or taken to prison, then I was uh, trying to persuade myself that, okay, you're not alone, just uh, be patient, go to the prison, stay some time here. And I came home and I had like a nervous breakdown. And I realized that it's too much for my psychology. And then there was the information that the Ukraine will be closed in the next day. And we had like 24 hours to pack our things. We just took one suitcase and we fly with the very last plane to, to the Ukraine. Here, almost every morning I wake up, I see the eyes of my daughter. I mean, it seems a little bit like we're such a religious family, no, just uh, when she wakes up, I traditionally kiss her, take on arms, and we go to a huge window on the kitchen and see the skies, and I say, my baby, I'm so happy that we're safe. <laughs> it's really very important. There is no lucky in this movement. It's just if you didn't get caught, that means someone did. And you just survive from the situation. I don't feel like I'm not arrested now because I'm just lucky. They just didn't have the time to put evidence together. And when the movement slows down and they started to have the time to do so, they will start arresting people when they put pieces together. It's just a matter of time. It's disappointing that I have to consider the option of leaving Hong Kong permanently, but I feel like I'm doing the best I can and I will still try to do the best I can until I can't anymore. At the protests physically, it was also scary for so many uh, women protesters or even photojournalists and journalists because there had been some entities who are associated to political parties who attacked the protest square. They burned tents, they beat up protesters. And I remember that I was caught there one time between two sides of the protests. And I remember that this was a time where I really felt unprotected even though I had my full gear on, but only because I was a woman, I heard the most insane comment from one security personnel, which was, why are these women here? This is not a place for women to be. And I was clearly holding my camera and holding my, my phone and covering this. It also meant that whatever happens, whatever the consequences are, you put yourself there as a woman, so you need to bear the consequences. In addition to that, something continuous that I have been going through is online attacks and direct threats. We fear that everything that we're going through online now, because we oppose this political party, we fear that it might translate in the street. I wonder now if I will be able to cover the protests if they are to happen again in the same way that I did in 2019. Because what is happening now online is 10 times worse than what was happening in 2019. And this will certainly affect the way I, as a woman, cover the protests or go to the streets. This is what we witnessed in Beirut when a prominent Shiite political activist was assassinated in his car. He was shot in his head uh, because he spoke vocally about Hezbollah and about their politics and how he disagrees with them. Even though to me he was one of the most elegant and one of the most sophisticated uh, people who spoke about Hezbollah and who criticized them in politics.
the regime has tried to humiliate and to attack me in different parts of the country, but even in parliament. In one session, they locked the doors of parliament and the regime ordered one of the members of parliament, a woman of the Socialist Party, to, to hit me. De la diversidad de las versiones, el video se ha convertido en la prueba reina de los hechos. Estas imágenes obtenidas con un teléfono celular muestran cómo María Corina Machado fue golpeada y arrojada al piso por quien parece ser la diputada Nancy Asensio. She broke my nose and threw me to the ground. This was a moment in, in which I realized how far this regime was willing to go to break down the voices and the leaders the country had. These are obstacles that are you know, present, clear, growing. But I would say that the biggest obstacle is uh, the loss of hope in some people and, and seeing that some simply break down or concede. And I keep fighting because I have the conviction that the will to fight in the Venezuelan people needs to maintain alive and growing, and that's what I dedicate most part of my life. I've been very inspired by different women uh, around the world and different moments in history. There's a, a women movement called Ladies in White, Damas de Blanco in Cuba. They have demonstrated resilience, conviction, courage that, that have been truly inspiring for me. Actually, I met one of their main leaders, Berta Soler, one day when I was arriving at an airport in Florida in the U.S. and she recognized me and came over. Fuera los Castro de Cuba, fuera los Castro de Venezuela y fuera Maduro de Venezuela. Cuba, Venezuela, hermano. And, and we hug each other because we never thought that we were going to meet personally. Sí, la verdad. La verdad que el gobierno del régimen venezolano intentó impedir que se conociera. I found inspiration, experiences and knowledge, uh, but also company in all these women that uh, are still struggling and fighting for the freedom of our country. We had a hot debate about uh, feminism in Belarusian protest. For me, it is feministic because women, they realize their power. They are so brave. They go out on the streets. They are creative. They are supportive. They went like sisters, mothers, wives, fighting with regime on the streets. At the same time, no one took away from them all those routine which women usually do, you see? For, for me, it's a very feministic movement. I really felt this uh, sisterhood of brave women, of such powerful women. For me, it, it sounds and it is happening in feministic key. Women activists from Lebanon met with a variety of women activists from different countries. And what we heard was that there are two main issues that are happening and that are shared among all countries. And they are domestic violence, the one essential problem that no country seems to be able to have control of, and at the same time underestimating how much women can take or what can women do. Women in Lebanon learned to push themselves to the front even when it's dangerous. Now, mothers have been doing this for years to protect their families in Lebanon, especially that we had a long civil war. But with the new generation, it definitely inspired us after looking at worldwide protests to try and lead ourselves, even if this means being in the pictures, even if this means being in front of the camera, even if this means being accused of wanting fame or seeking fame. Women don't care anymore as long as they can lead and as long as their words are heard. I'm sure that many of us 
are thinking about what is going to be next. If the process will stop, it will be a disaster because many people, like even at the moment, almost the whole country is in prison. I can hardly find a person who was not in prison, even for one day or several days. And when the whole revolutionary process will stop, we will lose everything what we have achieved at the moment. My personal idea is to continue doing our things, just to push, to push, to push the button till the moment while it blow away. And I think there is no way to stop. After the movement started, Hong Kong is not Hong Kong anymore. Everything changed. Hong Kong is still my home and I still want a home to come back. Can't say that I'm optimistic, but it is always the darkest before dawn. But I believe that any time Hong Kongers will be ready to do what we need to to get back our Hong Kong. I will try to do anything to achieve that. I think a lot of people will feel the same. The way I see it, freedom and liberalism mean acceptance. And we need to reach a point in Lebanon where we accept one another. We are far from that when you assassinate someone because they don't agree with you. So I think that the way forward is to keep focusing on the importance of first being able to express our opinions the way we want to express them and then remind people of this famous saying that I might disagree with you but I will still defend your right to say what you want to say and to express yourself. I believe that what's happening in Venezuela is probably the biggest opportunity liberalism has in the world. Imagine what it will be turning a country that is in devastation into prosperity, a country under oppression into freedom, a country that gives today pity into a country that gives pride and admiration. That's the degree of our challenge, and that can only be done in freedom. That is the, the reason why I wake up every day and I see more and more people joining our movement and sharing our dreams. In that sense, I have so much pride and, and, and confidence in what women are given, not only because of their, their, their actions and their energy, also because of the way they're raising our kids that have not lived yet in freedom, but desire it as much as we do. So I think that once we make this a reality, Venezuela will turn into an example, an inspiration, and a proof for the whole world of how liberalism is the way to bring prosperity, unity, and peace for our society. <laughs>